uh, as we just saw, uh, the fact that all we have, uh, if we believe is in the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, all we have is Christ. Uh, he is uh, He is our all. Uh, he is our joy. Uh, and the salvation that we have, the good news uh, that we have, is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, through his death and his resurrection, uh, we have come to be reconciled with God and to have eternal life. Uh, and so we have good news as Christians, as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, but that good news is highlighted even more as we understand more and more the bad news <laughs> that the Bible presents to us as well. Uh, so that's what we'll be thinking about this morning. And I hope that by understanding the human condition, the sad situation that we are in, uh, that we will appreciate more and more the good news of Jesus Christ and what he has saved us from. So, uh, as we begin this message on Genesis chapter 3, I want to ask you, uh, what's one of the worst things that you've done? Uh, what have you done, perhaps, when you reflect upon it and you think, oh, wow, that was really bad? Now, uh, I thought I might share a little bit from my life. Um, now, to be honest, I'll mention these things, but they are only at the surface. They I am even worse than what I will describe now. Uh, this is just a little highlight, this, just a little bit of things that I've done in the past, which reflect something of what I was like. Uh, for example, uh, and this seems like a bit of a theme today with, with me, uh, but when I was younger, uh, in church, uh, having my, uh, I grew up in church and I was the son of the pastor, one of the sons of the pastor, uh, I had an older brother, uh, and one day in church before the service, he really annoyed me. Uh, and so something that I did for some reason, uh, out of spite towards my brother, is I spat on his face. <laughs> no, I don't want that to be the thing that you remember from me. But uh, that's something that I did when I was quite young. Uh, in church, uh, I did that out of spite towards my brother, because he annoyed me. Something which I think is actually even worse is uh, when I was growing up, uh, I came with my parents when I was young, and my and my mum in particular didn't speak English very well, uh, and so I disrespected her, uh, and sometimes belittled her because of what because of her lack of English. Uh, there was pride in my heart, and my attitude was wrong towards her. There was also a time in my teenage years where I completely cut off being friends with someone. Uh, just because of what other people thought of that friendship. And so this is only at the tip of the iceberg. There's even worse things that I've done, which the Lord, which I'll be ashamed to share with you. And only the Lord knows. Uh, and the Lord knows even more the, the depravity of my heart, uh, even more than I do myself. Now, obviously, I'm not telling you this to boast of my past sins. But to get you to reflect on yourself and to think about your, our pettiness as human beings, our selfishness, our twistedness, our disrespect at times, our entitlement. Why was I like that in the past? Why am I still like that even in the present? Why are you like that? Why are human beings the way that we are? A phrase that I hear often uh, in sermons in Christian churches uh, is that the heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart. And I think that encapsulates it well. But there's, so there's something wrong with our hearts. But also, how can we diagnose this problem of the human heart? Now, how um, today's reading from Genesis chapter 3 gives us an answer to this fundamental problem. And only a right diagnosis, uh, which rightly understands the problem, can also give us the right solution as we think about this. You might go to a doctor with a problem, uh, and they will give you a diagnosis. Uh, they will tell you that this is the problem. But a misdiagnosis can cause even more problems rather than solve the problem. Uh, I knew of a, I knew of a, kind of a, a child, a teenager, uh, she started to show symptoms of headaches and loss of energy. There were also nerve problems and a high temperature as well. Uh, and for a couple of years, 
the doctors actually misdiagnosed him. Uh, and the problem actually got worse and worse rather than getting better. So a right diagnosis is really important. Right diagnosis of the human problem is really important. Otherwise, a misdiagnosis will make it even worse. So if we misdiagnosis our ultimate problem, then we could have even more problems later on. However, if we rightly diagnose our ultimate problem, then we can apply the right solution. Now, there are different stories that we tell ourselves about the reason for our ultimate human problem. Now, some stories will say that the problem lies with individual responsibility. So the person himself, him or herself, um, the problems arise when, for example, the individual doesn't have the freedom to act well or education to act wisely. Uh, and those who lean, I think, politically a bit more to the right, uh, may tend towards this story. Uh, they'll say that uh, if you get the individual rights, then everything will be fine. Give them the opportunities and so on. Some stories will say that the problem lies with society as a whole. Uh, the problems arise when society doesn't have the right social systems uh, to allow for equality or human flourish. Those who lean a bit more to the left uh, in politics will tend towards this story. We need, they'll say, we need to change the system, and so on. There's also, uh, there may be merit uh, to both these sides, but both these sides don't explain the problem fully or comprehensively. Uh, there's limits in both of them. There's also the question of whether the problem is something that we are born with or something that comes about through our upbringing. Now, children do learn a lot from adults by mimicking uh, good things and bad things. Uh, they learn through they learn through nurture. Uh, and so some people will talk about that uh, as the kind of like the reason for the problems that arise. Uh, but children also do things which they're not taught to do, do they? Uh, let me ask you, for those of you who had, uh, who had children who are parents, uh, have you ever taught your child uh, to throw a tantrum. Did you demonstrate that? Is that the thing that the child is mimicking? No, hopefully not. Uh, but it's something that children just do, isn't it? Out of frustration, out of anger, for whatever reasons. Uh, have you ever taught your child to lie? But maybe for the first time when you saw that your child lied to you, you're thinking, whoa, where did they learn that? It seems like something which is built in us. There's, there's nature, nature nurture debate that comes along as to the human problem. Now, both of these explanations may have merit as well, but they're limited answers as well. We need a comprehensive explanation, a right diagnosis of the human problem. And so the Bible story, God's story, I hope you will see, gives us a comprehensive explanation of our problem. The problem is what we call sin. It affects every aspect of our lives, and it's a big conflict in the story. As we see the Bible's account of our problem, I hope you'll feel something of its diagnosis of you. It'll be piercing into your heart to reveal what you're like. But ultimately, as you accept its diagnosis, I hope you'll receive the remedy that it prescribes to you as well. And find that there is an amazing solution to this ultimate problem that we have. So first, the problem of sin. Look with me to Genesis chapter 3, uh, and I'll just read again the first couple of verses. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beasts of the field the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. So we see this direct rebellion 
to the command that God had given to Adam right at the beginning in Genesis chapter 2. Now, this is a story that Genesis gives us about the start of the human problem. The serpent, we read of later on in Revelation and throughout the Bible, is Satan, the father of lies, who lied to the woman about God. Now, the serpent doesn't start off with a blatant lie. He doesn't say, uh, God, you shouldn't trust God. He doesn't say that uh, God didn't tell you to do this. But he puts God's goodness into doubt through a question. His question makes God sound stingy, almost. And as if he wants to hold something back from humanity, he sows that doubt into the woman's mind. And the woman's reply that we see in verse 2 uh, is not as bad as a serpent's, but she also twists God's word as well. Let me explain. She says uh, that God said, uh, you, must not, you shall not eat of the fruits of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Now, if you look back to Genesis chapter 2, actually, uh, she gets some of it right, but some of it wrong. So, for example, um, something that is in the midst of the garden. Uh, oh, if you look just uh, in, the, in the church Bible, if you just look to your left, um, in, uh, to verse, verse 9 of chapter 2, it says, And out of the ground the Lord, uh, out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of the life, tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So the trees that were actually in the midst of the garden is the tree of life, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's only the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that God commanded not to eat. And also, did God command Adam and, uh, Adam and his wife to not touch the, the tree? There's nothing of that in Genesis 2. And also she says, lest you die, but the Lord, when he warns uh, Adam and his, and his wife, he said, you will surely die. So in some sense, the woman weakens the consequences of eating of this fruit as well. So in some sense, she makes God's command less clear, but also more restrictive at the same time, to not touch it. That's not something that God said. And makes breaking it sound less serious as well. And I think that's a lesson for us as we think about it. We often fall into temptation and disobey God when we first of all view him to be stingy and restrictive, uh, like, the, like a serpent tempta tempted uh, the woman to think, and also to think of the consequences of our disobedience to be less serious. Like children who disobey their parents, uh, they don't think about the goodness of their parents, they think their parents are holding something back, that they're being stingy, uh, and they make their commands less clear and think that the consequences will be as bad. In a similar way, we twist God's word. And we see with the woman here, twisting God's word uh, as the serpent was leading her astray. Then we see in verse 4 and 5, the serpent makes a blatant lie, saying, you will not die. You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open." And you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. The sad thing is, humanity was already like God. They were made in God's image, unlike the other creatures, even the angels. There's nothing about angels being made in the image of God. Humans who were made out of the dust and breathed onto them the breath of life were made in the image of God. They had that unique privilege. But the serpent attempted them to think that God was holding something back from them. That they were to be like God through eating of this fruit. The serpent changed the story in the woman's mind of what God was like and what he wanted for her. That's something that I want to kind of bring into your mind as well. Uh, there's always a lot of stories going around in the world as well, narratives that changes our mind, that changes our view of the world, that changes our view of God and view of what God wants for us. When we see in Genesis chapter 1, 1 and 2, God's story tells us that he is generous and wanted humanity to enjoy creation and be his representatives. God made them to love and enjoy fellowship with him and with one another. They were naked with openness and no shame. Men and women in were in perfect 
partnership with God and with each other, working and taking care of the garden. They were to start in the garden even, but they were also to be fruitful uh, and to multiply, to fill the whole earth. And the blessings of the garden were to extend out as they multiply. God's image would fill the earth. And they were to do this by trusting in God's wisdom, not their own. This was the test set by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They were to trust God's definition of good and evil and not their own definition. The world will be filled by God's glory as there's more and more humans being filled. And it would have been amazing to see. But the serpent's lie changed that story, making the woman believe that God was stingy and restrictive, that God was holding something back from them because he didn't want them to be like. So the woman saw the tree with different eyes this time. Perhaps before she saw the tree and said, oh, God told me not to eat this. But now she sees it, and her view had been changed because of the serpent's lies. She wanted to be wise, not according to God's wisdom, but defining wisdom for herself. She also gave some to her husband. Sadly, he didn't refuse it or rebuke her, but he also ate. Their eyes were opened, and they knew that they were naked. Awakened to the shame and to the potential harm that they could do to each other. And he pathetically sowed fig leaves and tried to cover themselves. We see sin enter into the world. And my second point, what are the effects of sin that we see in the story and around in the world around us and even in our own lives? We're going to read that as an immediate result of their disobedience, the fall, they hid themselves from God. Rather than enjoying his presence, now they feared God's presence. They became separated and alienated from God. They died spiritually, in a sense. Also, they became separated and alienated from each other. They're still one as husband and wife. They're broken. Now look with me to verse 12 and 13. Uh, we see this response uh, by Adam when God asks, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I command you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you have give, given, whom you gave to me, that gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. Now, can you see the blame game going on? He's not willing to acknowledge that, yes, I've disobeyed you. But he's saying the woman that you gave me, Lord. There's brokenness in their relationship. They're one, but it's broken. In verse 22 and 23, we read, they are also placed out of the garden to work the ground from which man was taken and also no longer having access to the tree of life. Humanity would not live forever as was the first intention of God. God declares the consequences of their, of their disobedience to the woman. God said he will greatly increase the woman's pains in childbearing. Now, this isn't just talking about the physical pain that there is when giving birth. Uh, I don't know much about it myself, uh, but also the difficulties in conception. Uh, there's miscarriages that often happen. That's a consequence of the fall. Child problems in child rearing, raising children, that's all part of the human fallen condition. There will also be conflict between men and women. Women will often be frustrated because of the consequences of the fallen world. And you can kind of think the command that God gives in Genesis 1 to be fruitful, to multiply and fill the earth will be more difficult to do now because of these things. To the man, God says the ground which the man will work is cursed. It will produce thorns and thistles, making it difficult to work and to eat. And the man, Adam, will die and return to the ground, Adam, from which he came from dust to dust. Again, the command to be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth will be more difficult to do because of a fallen world. And so because of humanity's disobe disobedience to God, we see that pain and problems from the beginning of life with birth entered into the world and problems with health, pains and problems during life with relationships entered into the world. 
pains and problems during life with the stress and strain of work entered into the world as well. And pains and problems to the end of life with death entered the world. All of life has been affected by sin. And we read through Genesis 4 that sin spreads and escalates and gets even worse. And as we read from Genesis 6 verse 5, God sees the world now, the world that he had made, which was very good, and says that the, the, God's, the Lord sees how great man's wickedness on the earth had become. That every inclination, every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That is what God sees now in this fallen world. Now, the story that God tells us to explain this problem of the human heart is sin. Because of the human form, we're born with sin. It's not that we're born innocent and sin enters into us uh, as we grow up, that we learn it, but we're born with sin. Sin has spread like a virus and it has corrupted all of humanity. It affects our nature, how we are born, as well as our nurture, how we are raised. It affects the individual as well as society as a whole. It's a comprehensive explanation of all that we see in the world. I believe no right-wing or left-wing politics can solve it. No psychiatry, medication, or technology can rid us of it. It's all-encompassing and all-invasive in our human existence and experience, affecting all our relationships. It then affects our relationship with God. It separates us, it separates us from Him and has... And, uh, and has made us by nature his enemies. It's sad to think that we were made to be his representatives, or we became his rebels. Sin affects our relationship with one another. It causes us to hate. It causes us to murder, to envy each other as individuals, as tribes, as nations. The wars that we see is all a result of sin. It affects our relationship with the world as well. God made us to look after the world, to steward it. But it's made it difficult to live in. And we sadly exploit and abuse the world rather than look after it. Sin has affected our relationship with life and death as well. Because of sin, life itself is full of sorrow and misery. It's not as it should be. And we all face death in our lives. Now, this is the Bible's diagnosis of the human problem, the problem of our hearts. Now, I want to ask you, what do you think of this diagnosis? What do you think of this diagnosis of you? I want it to sink in for you. Have you seen the symptoms of the disease of sin in your own life? Have you seen the ugly effects of sin in the world at large? All of it is rooted in sin. Now, I know sometimes, uh, because of, I, sometimes I think especially men <laughs> might find it difficult to accept the diagnosis and go to a hospital to get treatment and so on. Uh, we're sometimes a bit proud. Uh, but as we reflect upon God's diagnosis here of our human parts, we must accept this diagnosis. In the Bible, there's actually uh, several words that are used to describe what sin is like. Uh, so the words are sin iniquity and transgression. And I kind of think we don't use those words as much nowadays, even in English. And I kind of wanted to explain what they mean. It speaks about sin, uh, which is about missing the mark. So if you have like an arrow and there's a mark, a target, uh, the word sin uh, in Hebrew is about missing the mark, missing the target. And I think kind of maybe um, what we can relate to in our modern English, uh, we might be more familiar with the word moral failure. I think that might come to our minds a bit more. So, for example, uh, when I spat when I was younger at my brother's face, I didn't miss his face, but I missed the mark of being a good brother. I failed in my ways. The Bible uses the word iniquity, which is about crookedness and twistedness, moral perversion. When I disrespected and belittled my mum, I was crooked and twisted 
in my attitude. It speaks about transgression, which is about breaking trust, moral rebellion, and betrayal. When I cut off my friend, I broke his trust and betrayed him. And so I want you to think, how has sin affected your life? How is it affecting your life, perhaps still? And also, as you reflect on this in your own life more and more, you'll realize how you have failed God, how you've spat on his face, as it were, how your attitude towards God is twisted, and how you have rebelled against him and betrayed him. Is that diagnosis of sin, of your human heart, of your human condition sinking in as you read the words of Genesis chapter 3? Now, if I was just to give you the diagnosis and said, this is your problem, sort it out, that would be a very bad sermon. <laughs> that would be a very bad uh, message to give to you. But thankfully, even in Genesis chapter 3, there is the promise of salvation that God gives to us. A solution for this massive, ultimate human problem that we see in our hearts and the world around us. God already, in Genesis 3, of the human fall, gives us, prom gives us a, promise of a promise of a solution, promise of salvation. Uh, look with me to verse 15 of Genesis 3. Uh, he says to the serpent, uh, after, after saying, uh, because we've done this, first are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. Uh, in verse 15, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Now, the Lord gives this promise uh, of this kind of enmity, uh, of, this, uh, of this serpent head-crushing seed of the woman that will come. From the woman's descendant will, be, will come this serpent crusher who will defeat evil. Although the serpent will bruise his heel, do some damage to the serpent crusher. Now, if you're familiar with the Bible, let's think. Who is there who defeats evil, who defeats Satan, yet suffered himself as well? Jesus. Already from the beginning, God gives the promise of the good news of salvation. This promise gets traced out throughout the Old Testament, and it comes to its climax in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. The good news that sin will be resolved, not through education, not through politics nor technology, but through the woman's offspring who will suffer because of sin and Satan, but will crush Satan's head. Now, I believe that Adam heard this promise and he would have passed it on to his children. And one of the reasons that I think uh, Adam trusted God and the good news, that he believed the good news as well, is right after God pronounces the various curses. Look with me to verse 20. Uh, this is Adam's response. It, it seems a bit strange, but I think if we understand what this means, we'll get kind of why, why we see this here. So we read in verse 20 of chapter 3, the man called his wife's name Eve. So before, prior to this, it's all referred to as the woman, the woman, the woman, the woman. For the first time here, she's referred to as Eve because she was the mother of all living. Now, ooh, you're thinking, well, why does why is this referred to as here? What, what is going on in this passage? It's most likely that the reason that Adam named his wife Eve, which means life, uh, so you might have heard of the word Hawa uh, for Eve. Uh, some, some languages have her name in that way. Uh, and it comes from the Hebrew word life. And so she was, Adam was naming his wife life. And I think this is because he's responding to the promise that he's heard given about the seed of the woman, crushing the head of the serpent and bringing about life. And so this is an example of God's mercy to humanity. Even in judgment, the promise is given and Adam believes it and names his wife Eve. Life. Trusting that through the seed of the woman, there would eventually be life again to those who entered into death. So the solution to the problem of sin would come through her offspring. And Adam, I believe, trusts in this, believes this, and goes on to tell it uh, to his children later on as well. 
Now for you, for us, only when we come to trust in Jesus as the serpent crusher, the sin defeater, the world savior, only when we come to trust in him can the problem of the sinful human heart be resolved. When we come to know Jesus, the serpent head crusher, does God forgive our sins and cures us of our sins? He gives to us a new heart. He takes away our stony heart, our sin-sick heart, and gives us a heart of flesh so that we are able to love him and love one another, even our enemies, in the world he created. It may be tough, but I urge you to accept the diagnosis that God makes of your condition. Now, just to clarify, uh, as I kind of gave with the example to the children, now, uh, when we talk about total depravity uh, in the Bible, uh, when we speak about total depravity, it means that all of our ca capacities, our mind, our hearts, our will, has been affected by sin. Uh, but it also doesn't mean that we are utterly dead. It doesn't mean that we are worse, as we, uh, as we, that we are as bad as we could be. God preserves us by his grace, but we've all been tainted by sin, like the spit analogy, uh, so that what we do is displeasing to God. Now you can take a whole a whole glass of uh, of kind of of, of spit, as it were, uh, and that would be really displeasing. That would be something which is uh, yeah, that would be something which is even worse. But uh, God, although He preserves us, we're not as bad as we could be. But nonetheless, what we do is displeasing to God, and we need forgiveness, all of us. And so as you think about the human condition, yes, there is some good that we might uh, do to one another, and it's, and it's good things. But when we think about uh, how all of our lives have been tainted by sin, there's nothing which is pleasing to God. So I want to urge you, as you accept this diagnosis of how depraved we are, how twisted, how our attitudes have been twisted, how, how, how we fail morally all the time, how what we do is a moral rebellion to God as you accept and confess your sins before God and receive Christ as your only remedy, knowing that you can bring nothing in your hands but simply cling on to the cross of Christ. God will give you a new heart, a new, a new life, a new creation, which beats with love and life for him. And God will write you a new story, as it were, where you're no longer enslaved by sin, but set free from its bondage. A story in which you can re-enter into the Garden of Eden, as we're thinking about later, uh, before in the morning, and be in his presence, and fill the world as his image bearers with the glory of God. And so I want to urge you, uh, if you haven't done already, to accept this diagnosis, difficult though it might be at times, turn to the remedy that there is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And for us who have maybe already turned to him, to delight more and more in it, as we see what our condition was like and how he has transformed us, and delight in the good news as we reflect on the bad news of our sins. Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Almighty God, Lord, as we see uh, this short chapter in Genesis chapter 3, though it is in some sense very short, there is so much contained in it. And Lord, it explains to us our human condition in a way which, Lord, this world uh, with various diagnoses of what, our, what we are like, fail to do in so many ways. And we pray, Lord, that you help us to continue to meditate on these words and you will reveal to us what we are like, but also to reveal to us the good news that there is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we are often too easily deceived by the lies of Satan. And we pray, Lord, that you'll give us clarity of thinking and that you'll reveal to us your truth more and more as we meditate upon your words. And Lord, as we delight in the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ, help us to know more and more of what we are saved from and what we are saved for, to know your presence in our life, to know that restored fellowship with you. And so if there's any here, Lord, any of us amongst here who have not yet 
received, we have not yet accepted that diagnosis of the, of the human condition. Lord, who may be still searching our hearts, Lord, who may be still dwelling in their sins. Lord, help them to know that there is this correct, this true diagnosis, and that there is a remedy in the Lord Jesus. Lord, that they can go to him to be cleansed and be forgiven of their sins, to be made new, so that we can live lives which are pleasing to you. And help us who have already come to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, who have been transformed by your grace, Lord, to continue our lives in obedience to you, though we sin to know that forgiveness which is available for us daily, and to know your presence in our lives, and to represent you as your image bearers, and to fill this world with your glory as you have commanded us. So help us. May your grace work in our, in our midst, in our, in our lives. May you, Lord, continue to in, enliven and give us hearts which love, uh, loves you and is full of life, and that we would grow in the likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. We pray this in his name. Amen. Amen. Amen.